All right. Welcome back, everyone, to our, I believe this is our sixth week of the ABCs of Sports Nutrition. I'm joined today by uh, the professor, Dr. Greg Grisicki, and also a good friend to Goo and friend of mine, Jonathan Levitt. Uh, today, we will be talking about supplements to support immunity. My name is Roxanne Vogel. I'm the Nutrition and Performance Research Manager at Goo Energy Labs, which means I get to work with our athletes to help them with their nutrition. I also run our performance lab where we do metabolic testing and other experiments to better understand human physiology. And I also work in the research and development department to help create and improve products that we release for all you fine people. So a little bit about our guests today. Jonathan is the sales and endurance team manager at Inside Tracker, which you'll hear a little bit more about in just a moment. Um, we do use Inside Tracker in the performance lab to help us understand what's going on with our athletes, sort of to look underneath the hood, so to speak. But Jonathan will fill you in a little more on that in just a moment. He's also an athlete and a six-time marathoner who narrowly broke three hours in a recent marathon. He's also run the rim to rim to rim of the Grand Canyon. And because of 2020 being what it is, he's recently gotten more into cycling, both on road and gravel. He's a podcast host of uh, the podcast For the Long Run, which is aimed at exploring the why for people who are into very long distance running. And his fourth episode, fun fact, included our very own VP of R&D, Magda Boulay. We also have the professor, uh, Dr. Greg Grisicki. He's joined us before for an episode. He's a assistant professor and the director of exercise physiology laboratory in the biodynamics and human performance at our Georgia Southern University. He has his PhD in human bioenergetics from Ball State University and a postdoc from Tufts University as well. Uh, he's very knowledgeable about all things related to exercise physiology and sports nutrition. And we had such a good time with you the other day on our, pod, on our, on our live cast that we just had to have you back for more. So thank you guys so much for joining. For everyone who's tuned in, we do look forward to your questions. So please send them through in the live chat and we'll try to get to all of them if we can during the episode. And as a reminder, these episodes are brought to you by Jackrabbit and you can save 25% on your next Goo Nutrition order if you use the code FUEL25. So without much further ado, I wanted to talk a little bit today about, you know, we're going into fall and winter, which is, as we all know, the flu season, people tend to get colds at this time. And what can we really do to protect ourselves from getting sick? I mean, not to mention we're in a pandemic, but just thinking kind of short term, guys, what are you doing? And I'll start with you, Jonathan. What do you generally do to stay healthy? Like what is your nutrition involved? What kind of supplements might you take? Or what, how does your training change if you're worried about getting sick? Yeah. Uh, first, thanks for having me on, uh, Roxanne. Um, yeah, the biggest thing for me is sleep, uh, making sure I'm doing everything I possibly can to support good quality sleep and getting eight hours at a bare minimum. Uh, the way that I do support the, the sleep quality is I do take the, the uh, magnesium vitamin D combo that you guys offer. I take that right before bed and it helps keep my those two levels up that are both related to, uh, to sleep quality. Um, the other piece is, you know, I don't have coffee after 2 PM and it's just everything to, to facilitate that good sleep. Um, I focus on rest and recovery and making sure I'm not, you know, if I go into the well a little bit that I, um, recover well from uh, whatever endeavors that I've done. Um, and then, Oh, you asked about the, the supplements I take. Um, yeah, I take that. I take a garlic supplement, which is also proven to help support immunity, um, and some other biomarkers, which I'm sure we'll talk about and, um, an ashwagandha, which, uh, ah. helps with cortisol, your stress levels. I That's a good all one. That yeah. yeah. All that together helps. We'll have to touch on that a little bit later. Thank yes. you. And Greg, what about yourself? Yeah, Roxanne, thanks for having me on again. And thanks to Goo. I appreciate it. So I think uh, Jonathan's emphasis on sleep is, is absolutely huge. Certainly lifestyle factors have a, an immense impact on 
uh, immune health. And it's just uh, sleep is, is obviously a huge one. So I think making sure we get enough of that, um, particularly as the school year starts again and we're all transitioning to new things in life, uh, trying to minimize stress is another big one. Um, so whatever your winding down routine is before sleep, I feel like that's been one of the ones that's influenced sleep the most for me, be it some sort of meditation or, or, or breathing type exercises. I find, I found that's helped me a lot. And then for supplements, uh, I've done a lot of research on the microbiome. So I do take, uh, probiotics made by yours truly at, at uh, at goo. And then, uh, I'll, I'll intermittently use uh, vitamin C and, and zinc to support uh, immune health, as I'm sure we'll talk about in a little bit, making sure I'm getting outside, getting ample amounts of, uh, of vitamin D as well. And then we talked about it last podcast, how carbohydrates were good for performance, but they're also extremely important for immune function. So making sure I get uh, eat sufficient amount of carbohydrate, any excuse to eat more carbs uh, would be great. Very nice. Very nice. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I know personally, like this summer I did actually have uh, a COVID exposure. And so that changed the way that I, for those two weeks I had to quarantine, really thought about supplementing and supporting the immune system. And so a lot of the things you guys already touched on, you know, like getting the probiotics and not just from supplement, which I do take our probiotics plus supplement, but also from just fermented foods and things like that and getting extra fiber to help support the gut health, um, getting plenty of extra sleep where I could, hydrating, um, all of those things really coming into sharp relief that, you know, when you're exposed to a virus or if you're worried about getting sick, you really need to pay attention to some of these things. So, um, yeah. But let's first, I want to do a couple of fun facts about the immune system. So the average American gets about two to three colds per year, and most of them are recovered from their symptoms within about seven to 10 days. A fever is caused by your immune system, not the infection. And it's your body's way of increasing its temperature to help activate the immune system and create an environment that's inhospitable to bacteria and viruses. A lot of times... Uh, harmless infections that go unnoticed otherwise can actually impair your athletic performance. So even if you're not noticing you're sick, you still could be suffering uh, in your athletic endeavors just because, you know, there are things going on underneath the surface. And finally, allergies are actually caused by the immune system. So har harmless things like pollen or specific types of food that cause a response by the immune system are what are better known as allergies. So with that, I wanted to start with a little short tutorial about the immune system. And I know, Greg, being a professor, you have maybe a little something to share with everyone. Yeah, I do. Thanks, Roxanne. So yeah, I'd like to share some slides with you guys. So let me share a screen real quick. So we all hear the word immune system and immune health. And we know that the immune system's primary goal in the body is to help protect us against foreign invaders, be they bacteria or viruses or fungi that are trying to enter our body from the outside world in. But I think one of the things we don't maybe necessarily know as well is that the immune system also plays an extremely important role in tissue repair, which as athletes is certainly something that we can all relate to. We know whenever we do exercise, we're breaking our tissues down and that the immune system plays a fundamental role in the repairing and the rebuilding of those tissues. And so that's another reason I think we can appreciate immune health, but I think one of the questions kind of we all have and, and scientists have had for a while now is what is the effect of exercise on immune health? And uh, there's a fantastic researcher at Appalachian State by the name of David Riemann, who's been doing pioneering work in this field for the past couple of decades now and this uh, figure published from one of his papers in, in 1994. Uh, this is great, we think, for most of us as athletes. It shows on the y-axis uh, or the vertical axis, we're looking at the uh, risk of getting a uh, upper respiratory tract infection, which um, are, is one thing that happens a lot in athletes. Um, and then on the x-axis or horizontal axis, we look at how activity may influence that. And we see that 
people who do moderate amounts of exercise tend to get sick less. So this is great, right? As, uh, as athletes, why do we need to worry about immune health? We're getting sick less. And I think um, the type of exercise is really important in the context of this figure. When we say moderate amounts of exercise here, we're talking about going for a walk maybe three or four times a week for 30 minutes. And we're not talking about maybe the type of exercise that you all are interested in where we're actually training for a competitive event. And in fact, those who do more exercise, be it training for a marathon or cycling or really any form of endurance exercise might actually be at greater risk um, for getting sick. And I think we can all probably relate to this if anyone's ever done a really big event. Uh, it's very, very common for us to get sick after. I can say that um, after my first Ironman, I, I had a nasal infection that I thought was going to last months. Like it's just, it's super common for, as we're training really hard, we're wearing down our immune system. We're really taxing our body and it's totally, uh, totally common to get sick. And so I think that really gives us, uh, reason to care about immune health as athletes. So let's just take a quick look. Um, I know Jonathan and inside tracker, they do a great job of looking at some of these markers of immune health. But to be able to interpret those markers, I think it's important that we understand a little bit of what the immune system is, what it consists of, and what they might be. So if we look at the immune system, it can really be broken down into two different branches. We have the innate immune system. And so that's really the immune system we're born with. And then we have the adaptive immune system. And the adaptive immune system learns from past exposures to, to different pathogens and foreign invaders and it learns their signatures and, and so it can adapt to kill off those infections. The innate immune system furthermore is composed of, uh, can be, is, has, has a primary defense, which is really these anatomical barriers between the outside world, the bacteria and viruses, and then the inside of our body. The first one we would think as far as anatomical barriers go would, would be the skin. This is the largest organ in the body and Clearly the skin prevents things in our, in our surroundings from, from getting inside of us. But we also have um, contained in this kind of anatomical barrier, uh, mucosal lining in our mouth and in our eyes and, and in our gastrointestinal tract that will act to thwart uh, bacteria and viruses from coming in our body. And then there's also various antimicrobial proteins, which are really proteins that will attack um, these foreign substances before they make their way into the inside of our body. If by chance, one of these, uh, these, these, these foreign invaders does make its way in, then we have this initial cellular defense um, made up of, of white blood cells, which are also known as leukocytes. And specifically, these are monocytes and neutrophils and they act kind of like the cookie monster trying to, attack, trying to attack bacteria and viruses that are coming in. They go around, they engulf it, and they, and they, and, and they you know, try, to, try to kill basically any sort of thing that the body recognizes as being foreign. But it's really important here to, to realize that these are indiscriminate and they don't necessarily recognize a specific foreign invader. So if this initial cellular defense doesn't work, we have this adaptive immune system. And this will act over, or, over days or possibly weeks of being sick. And this is composed of both uh, humoral and cell mediated branches. Again, these are leukocytes or white blood cells. And, and particularly when we talk about the adaptive immune system, we're, we're really specifically looking at, uh, at cells known as lymphocytes. And so the, the, the primary ones that are discussed in this context are uh, B lymphocytes and T lymphocytes. B lymphocytes will go around and secrete antibodies to neutralize foreign invaders. And these, these T lymphocytes, also known as cytotoxic T cells, they'll kind of bind to foreign bacteria and viruses and inject cytotoxins into them to, to kill them and, and to stop them from proliferating and, and from making us sick. So that's kind of just a, a rough overview of the immune system. I think what's really important, the key takeaway here is that it's quite complex, clearly, and it's made up of a lot of cells. And the immune cells in particular have among the highest metabolic rates of cells in our body. So they're constantly needing nutrients and they need a diverse array of nutrients um, 
macronutrients, things like carbohydrates, fats, and proteins, as well as micronutrients. Um, so, you know, we, we were all talking about things that we might take and different supplements, things like uh, zinc and vitamin D and vitamin C and, and, uh, and all of these other things that, that may help to support immune health are really fueling these cells in our immune system to fight against uh, pathogens. So, and so that's the brief tutorial. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. Yeah, I also like to think of our immune system as like our little, you know, defense army. So that we have like different factions with their certain responsibilities, all the different cells of the immune system. But uh, turning a little bit to talk about how do we, you know, how do we know if our immune system is on track? And I know Jonathan and I have worked a lot with some of the athletes that Goose sponsors, um, and we're constantly checking different biomarkers. So levels of certain elements in their blood of interest. And Jonathan, um, I know I even wrote a blog, what was a couple years back now about some of the most commonly deficient uh, or insufficient levels that I see in our athletes. Um, so maybe you could talk a little bit about what biomarkers Inside Tracker uses to look at things like immunity or immune function. Um, but even more broadly than that, maybe first a little intro to Inside Tracker in general for folks who aren't familiar and you know what you guys are all about. Sure. Um, yeah. Thanks for the intro there. So at Inside Tracker we aim to help drive decision-making around nutrition, supplementation, and lifestyle, right? There are so many different things that we can choose to do tomorrow. And our system is intended to help you make the best and most efficient decisions. So you feed us information and a blood test, and we feed you do these three to five things differently. So eat this food, take this supplement, consider modifying lifestyle in this way. So it's it's highly personalized, there's no opinion, and it's all science and evidence-based. So um, we've loved the relationship with Goo and Goo's sponsored athletes because who best to you know, listen to, to guidance that says, if you do this, you'll improve than professional athletes. You know, it's their job to perform um, and they'll do, you know, they'll do what it takes. So it's been cool working with you guys and as a way of innovating, you've looked at the, these common deficiencies and actually created products that, that facilitate um, that type of progress. And we're talking specifically the magnesium, the vitamin D and the probiotic, which are some of the most common recommendations that we have in general, but also related to immunity. So when you ask about, you know, what are the biomarkers specific to immune health? Um, this was a question that came up obviously back in March in particular at the start of the pandemic. And our team actually created a, a product called Immunity. And it's a selection of a dozen or so biomarkers that are most specific to immunity, stress, and sleep. So how do we optimize these areas? Well, we have to know where we're starting. And so those markers in particular are glucose, hemoglobin A1C, which many people are familiar with, um, vitamin D, magnesium through both serum and RBC, uh, HSCRP, which is an indicator of inflammation, cortisol, which we talked about as your stress hormone, uh, the complete blood count, which uh, was referenced talking about the, the white blood cells and, and what goes into um, sort of the, the attacking the invader process, um, as well as ferritin, a liver enzyme for men, we look at testosterone and women, we look at DHEAS. Um, so that's a pretty holistic approach um, when it comes to what are the best things that we can do to support immunity um, or understand where are you from an immune system perspective. And what we've found is that many people are deficient in, in, in many of these areas, um, particularly with, uh, you look at something like vitamin D. And there was a study that came out um, today, actually, um, that was looking at, um, it was the first randomized controlled trial on vitamin D and COVID. And it was essentially highlighting the importance of vitamin D for the immune system and gut health specific to COVID. And there was a statistically, highly statistically significant um, 
outcome indicating a true causal relationship between vitamin D and reduced risk of uh, ICU admission. So they found that optimal vitamin D is very good, uh, essentially. Um, and we see uh, 35% of our population, of our inside tracker population being clinically deficient in that value. So 35% of people are starting, you know, in, in not a very good place. And, and it's interesting because these are people who are being proactive about their health. And you can kind of extrapolate that if 35% of these proactive people are deficient, the general population is uh, probably a little bit higher. Right. Yeah. And I've seen um, figures just from different papers that, you know, over half of the world's population is at right. least insufficient, um, which is not quite as extreme as being deficient, but, um, you know, that's, that's a lot. And, you know, a lot of it has to do with where you live. So if you live above like the 35th or 37th parallel, it is, you get less sun exposure. So a lot of our vitamin D is actually synthesized in the skin from UVB sunlight exposure. Um, and so, you know, that or training indoors or being constantly covered by either sunblock or, or clothing that doesn't allow the UV B radiation to get through, all of those things can make it difficult to get substantial vitamin D production just from your skin. But you know uh, what's fascinating about that? We do, yeah. we do a lot of work within Major League Baseball. And so you think that these guys who are outside training all the time uh, are are going to be optimal. You know, they're training in Arizona, they're training in Florida, and, and they're outdoors all the time. They're just as deficient as anybody else. And and they they'll frequently say like, hey, what the heck? I'm outside. How is this? How is this possible? Um, it just is. And and so for these people, and and you you know, you think about ultra runners or or runners who are outside all the time. We might have that same. Um, same assumption and it's it's not always true right yeah and, and again it, it can also have to do with things just even like the pigmentation of your skin too so if you're darker skinned um, that's more likely to block out some of the uvb rays and so again less vitamin d production so there's a lot of factors that go into it uh, which is why you know so many people are either insufficient or deficient but my, what is the what is your kind of cutoff for optimal for i know Inside Tracker has a tighter range for a lot of biomarkers than like just standard healthy reference levels. Can you tell us what the number value is that you assign to like a good healthy vitamin D range? Yeah, so many of our biomarkers are dynamic and, and different based on the demographics or the activity type or gender or whatever it is that makes that person unique. Uh, for vitamin D, it's everybody should be above 40. Um, and so that's our, that's our minimum threshold. Whereas I believe quest and, and the clinical normal is 32. And you're talking about nanograms, not nanomoles, right? Correct. Correct. Yeah. There's a couple of different units of measurements. So sometimes it can get a little confusing, but I believe the conversion is, uh, 2.5 of nanograms to nanomoles in case anybody was really curious. Um, but let's move forward a little bit. I know we're getting a ton of questions um, and we are going to try to get to most of them. So please be patient. But I did want to touch quickly on just like a few things which we've already really mentioned that can really impact immune health. So um, gut health, sleep, diet, and then supplements, which is going to be the main focus of our conversation today. But just a little bit briefly, and I know, Greg, you've done a ton of work in this area, um, looking at the gut and immune responses and exercise. But you know, for people who don't know, the gut is actually home to over 70% of your immune system. And it's really, it's, it's one of your first lines of defense against the outside world and against you know pathogens and, and things coming into your body. If you think of your body as like a hollow tube from <laughs> your mouth to the bottom, uh, you know, the outside world comes in through that too. So um, can you talk a little tiny bit about how the gut is, you know, responsible for, for a lot of your immune function just briefly? Yeah, definitely. So yeah, the gut, it, 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 I think that's the, like the first thing I came to realize in studying it is, yeah, it's outside of us. It's really the outside's way in. Um, furthermore, it's composed of 40 trillion bacterial cells, which is 10 trillion more cells than make up us. And it may weigh up, so cells may weigh up to two pounds. Um, they're important for so many different physiological functions and processes. 
um, probably one of the first ones that comes to mind and is certainly important, not only for immune health, but just whole body health is that they play an integral role in digestion and absorption of the nutrients we eat. And we know that, as we said earlier, uh, immune cells uh, are highly metabolically active. And thus, if we have some sort of dysregulation in our gut that's uh, influencing our ability to uh, digest and absorb the important nutrients that we're eating um, and get those into our body, then that's a huge problem. And, and certainly there are tons of cases of um, microbial dysregulation that could, that could result in that. Um, from an exercise perspective, um, again, mild exercise and, and really exercise training is shown to ultimately improve uh, the health of our gut, which is kind of interesting and kind of a, a new uh, fact that we've only really learned over the past five years, I would say. But certainly excessive exercise, um, and particularly during exercise, one of the things that happens is uh, all the blood flow that's typically going to our gut while we're sitting around at rest goes to uh, the muscles that are trying to perform the activity. And so the gut is not getting a whole lot of, uh, of blood flow. And, and this can be a time that causes uh, some damage to some of the cells in the gut. And this is, uh, it, it could be a time to, uh, for, for really pathogens to make their way from the gastrointestinal tract into the circulation, which can uh, create a lot of inflammation. And, and uh, as Jonathan said, we can measure that with some of the biomarkers that, that they study. Um, and, and so really finding ways to improve the, the health and the integrity of our, our fact the, of the cells that make up our gut, our, it's known as our intestinal epithelium, um, with, a, with a probiotic is gonna be very important as well as to make sure that the bacterial cells we have in the gut are the healthy ones. We don't want a whole bunch of, of unhealthy ones growing. Um, and so by taking a, a probiotic, we can hopefully uh, encourage healthy bacterial cells in our gut and not the unhealthy ones. Right. And Jonathan, I know that, you know, you guys have done a lot of work looking at different strains of probiotics that might be beneficial for athletes and, and just talking about athletes, gut health in general. Um, and I know we've worked with some of our athletes and made recommendations. What are your kind of general guidelines when you're looking for a probiotic supplement that you recommend from your research standpoint? So we have a team of science and nutrition experts that is constantly reviewing the literature of um, studies that are coming out on an ongoing basis. And so as part of that, they've identified a handful of the specific probiotic strains that are contributing to the type of progress or health that, that we wanna see. Um, so what we look for in a probiotic supplement is having at least one of those strains um, so that there's evidence-based uh, recommendations to say this is something that, that you should take. Um, now, fortunately, Goo has one of those strains in, in the probiotic supplement. Um, so it is one that we recommend uh, to the athletes, yes. And I can't remember what the, what the name of the strain is, but if, if you're ever bored, you can, you can read the, the probiotic strains because they're, they're quite long. Yeah, it's like a great way to practice your Latin. Um, yeah, so in exactly. ours, I'll give you, so we have Bacillus subtilis and Bacillus coagulans, which those are both spore forming uh, types of probiotic strains. And the reason we do that is because the ones that can form uh, spores actually survive the harsh environment of your digestive tract. So, you know, the acid in your stomach and such uh, can be very aggressive and kill a lot of probiotics that go in live, but then, you know, they eventually die before they get to where they need to go. Um, and the other thing that I know through looking at some of the research that Inside Tracker has done, uh, looking for something that's not only multi-strain, so more than one strain of potential bacteria, but looking for something that's about 10 billion CFU or colony forming units per day was what I was looking at when I was doing the research behind this particular product. Um, so I know that we've had a lot of back and forth, Jonathan, just talking about like product development. And again, the funny story of how 
working with Inside Tracker really led to the development of these two products, the Magnesium Plus capsules and the Probiotics Plus capsules. Um, and then both of them coming full circle, being supportive for like immune health. So it's, it's really kind of a cool story. Um, but also I know both of you guys talked about how sleep was really important when you are really trying to take care of yourself uh, and, and avoid getting sick. So I found a cool statistic that says that people sleeping six hours or less a night are actually four times more likely to catch a cold compared to people who sleep more than seven hours per night, which is huge, right? Like, and it, it really highlights the important role of sleep. So your immune system is actually more active while you're sleeping than when you're awake because you're not doing all the other things that are taking up those you know, critical resources, the energy, et cetera. Um, that your immune system needs to really option or function optimally. Uh, and that's why a lot of times, you know, your body rate, your body temperature might go higher at night or you wake up and you feel like you might be a little more sick or something in the morning is because your immune system has been so active at night uh, as, as opposed to when you're awake. And so these things can kind of manifest at night. I don't know if you guys have ever noticed anything like you wake up with a little more scratchy throat or you wake up in the middle of the night and you're like hot for some reason. It's your immune system being extra active when you're sleeping. So, um, but yeah, and then another question we did have come through was about what foods can really help support not only gut health, but also um, just immune health. So if we could quickly name a few foods, each of you guys that you know, or like have seen research behind that are important for immune function. Jonathan, I'll start with you. Yeah, so if we're looking at fermented foods and, and looking at foods that have probiotics, we're talking kimchi, yogurt, sauerkraut, miso, kefir, tempeh, um, these types of foods that are fermented. Um, and then zinc is another big uh, nutrient that we've talked a little bit about. If you like oysters, it's a good excuse to, to get some oysters. Um, vitamin C, I mean, you can't, you can't uh, go wrong with an orange or something citrus related. Um, and then vitamin D, uh, particularly if you're low, take a supplement, um, or take a supplement if you're low, uh, otherwise things like sunlight and fatty fish, egg yolks, um, uh, mushrooms and fortified milk, uh, can, can help boost that up or support a healthy level of that. Yeah. And we'll probably even touch on it later, why it might be almost more beneficial sometimes to supplement vitamin D versus getting it, trying to get it through your right. diet, because right. one, there's limited sources you can get it from. And two, a lot of the sources are a specific type of vitamin D, vitamin D2, which may not be as beneficial for boosting, uh, you know, your, your blood marker levels of vitamin D as compared to D3, which is what we're usually advocating when we look at supplements. Uh, and Greg, what about you? Okay. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, my understanding is that when you're below a certain threshold, you can't get it up through uh, nutrition. Diet. So, so taking it through a supplement is, is the only option at a, at a certain point. Yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, some people even require like almost mega doses of vitamin right. D at that point, if they're low enough to that point, like they, they could need more than 5,000 IU a day. So yeah, really difficult to get adequate amounts just through diet and sunlight at that point. Greg, what about you? Top foods for immune boosting function? Yeah, well, uh, in addition to what Jonathan said with the fermented foods, I think to add to that, um, I think fiber plays a, a very important role, not only for immune function, but there's actually this overlap. It's cool. We can bring the, these things together between the gut and sleep and immune function and how they're all interrelated. Specifically, um, there's been research really over the past two years from my lab as well as other labs that have shown a relationship between the gut microbiome and gut health and actually sleep. And we've known for a while that there's a relationship between the gut and the brain and this bi-directional communication access through the vagus nerve. Um, and there have been a, two or three papers now in, in and it, well, it's been known for a while, I guess, that people who have sleep apnea, for instance, tend to have a pretty um, unhealthy microbiome. Um, and now even in healthy individuals, our lab uh, recently published a paper in the Journal of Sleep Medicine, and there was a paper published uh, just right before it um, in another journal showing that we, we took people and we just asked them to report their, uh, 
their sleep quality as either good or bad. And we had this uh, objective scale. Um, and then we studied their gut microbiome and we showed that the people who slept really well had a, a really healthy microbiome and had a bunch of these healthy bacteria that you would get from eating a bunch of these, these fermented foods or these probiotic strains, things like lactobacillus and bifidobacteria. In particular, uh, bifidobacteria is one that's discussed very frequently in the context of, of its health promoting effects. And the way, it, it, the way some of these, these bacteria uh, elicit these, these health benefits is through the production of the short chain fatty acid in the gut known as butyrate. And, and there's certainly data, most of it is from animal models to this point, showing that by enriching uh, butyrate in the body, they sleep well. In fact, there was a study recently published in a journal where they actually injected uh, a butyrate derivative tributyrin into mice and it improved REM sleep immediately, like the next sleep. And so I think it's super cool that there's this relationship between what we eat and how we sleep and how it supports immune health. But uh, to answer that question, so fermented foods and, and butyrate, I guess I didn't really answer it, is, is produced, for, a lot of it is from the fiber that we eat. So yeah. bring, that, bring that full circle. Uh, we, we get the right bacteria, we give them their, their, the substrate they need to produce butyrate, we increase butyrate, we sleep better, we make our gut healthier, um, and, and we fortify our, our immune system that way. Uh, another one that, that's very near and dear to my heart um, for my last discussion with Goo is, is carbohydrate. Um, I think of all the, the immune supportive nutritional strategies, eating sufficient carbohydrate is, is very important. Um, even though glutamine, uh, the amino acid glutamine is, is often discussed in the context of providing fuel for lymphocytes, um, glucose is another major uh, fuel source for any of, the, any of the white blood cells in our body. And, there, and there's a number of studies showing that people who uh, are following are not consuming a sufficient number of calories or number of carbohydrates. They have a suppression of their immune cells. And even that I think this is really cool. Eating during exercise. So after we do a really intense exercise bout, uh, we have this kind of what they call referred to in the literature as this open window period where pathogens are more likely possibly to make us sick because we get this, uh, this acute or, or short duration. Um, we're in a, our, we, we have a short, uh, a compromise to our immune system for a short period of time after a really high intensity or vigorous exercise bout. And that by eating 30 to 60 grams of carbohydrate during exercise, we actually uh, attenuate that, that immunosuppression. And, and that's um, measured in a laboratory setting by a drop in some of these uh, very important immune cells. So carbohydrate is another important one. Yeah. You bring up a good point too about, you know, not only just carbohydrate, but being well-fueled in general. Um, so being, chronically low in, in calorie intake or, you know, low energy availability puts an, another layer of stress on your body, which makes you more susceptible to just getting sick. So, you know, first line of defense is eat enough food, <laughs> eat a variety of foods and get lots of fiber. So I always like to say, you know, um, the variety is a spice of life and eat the rainbow are kind of my mantras for just a food first approach. But you know, aside from diet and the food first approach, let's talk a little bit about supplements. Greg, you talked briefly about uh, supplementing with carbohydrate, which I totally appreciate. And uh, yeah, there is a lot of research to say that if you are supplementing during particularly long and uh, strenuous exercise bouts with carbohydrates that you experience less of a immunosuppressive effect after the exercise as compared to, you know, not taking in any carbohydrates at all. So that's pretty interesting. Um, also, you know, having enough protein in your diet and supplementing with protein, if you're not getting sufficient amounts of, of protein rich foods in your diet on a daily basis can help give you those amino acids, which are the building blocks, not only of like your muscles, but also of all the enzymes and, and other structures of your body that are important for immune function and your immune cells actually rely a lot on amino acids in addition to glucose, uh, as a fuel source. So you talked, you talked about glutamine, which is an amino acid. Um, having BCAAs can actually help feed forward and create glutamine in times of increased needs. So when you're sick, you have increased needs for things like glutamine. It's a conditionally essential, essential amino acid. Um, but yeah, a lot of times 
getting enough BCAAs in the diet can really help with fortifying your immune system. We talked about vitamin D quite a bit already. Um, so I want to talk a minute about zinc. And, um, you know, zinc is very important for T cell function, which is one of your, you know, your, your blood cells that's important for immune function. And it's also one of the very few scientifically backed ways that people can decrease the not only the severity, but also the duration of the common cold. So there's a lot of science behind it to say that if you notice the onset of a cold and you take vitamin, or sorry, if you take zinc supplements, a lot of times it's like lozenges, uh, about 75 milligrams per day, you can decrease the duration of your cold by 33%. That's a third less. It's like, you know, four days instead of six days of being sick, which is pretty neat. Um, and then, you know, the, on the on the other side, which Jonathan, you guys had a blog recently about supplements for immune function, talking about zinc and saying how people can kind of go overboard too. I don't know if you have any insights on that, but I know, you know, men and women respectively need 11 milligrams and eight milligrams of zinc. And we're talking about 75 milligrams a day. Like that's a ton more than you normally need. So maybe not supplementing with zinc. What are your thoughts on that? Yes or no, zinc? Uh, so the science, as you were talking about, supports supplementation of that. Um, our recommendation specific to um, cold prevention is 25 milligrams of zinc per day. Uh, many of these supplements come in a 50 milligram dose. So our dietitians will recommend splitting that in half. Um, but like you said, uh, our team looked at 13 randomized placebo controlled studies, and there was association between taking zinc within 24 hours and uh, of the first sign of a cold and shortening a uh, shortened duration in uh, and making the the um, the symptoms less severe. So definitely agree on the um, on the strategy. And it's it, as you said, yeah, 11 and eight is pretty low for the RDA compared to you know, you could take a single supplement and and that would be five times what uh, men would need even you know more for women. Um, so yeah, it's just you know being careful around that. It's not something you're going to do every day. Um, but again, you don't want to necessarily flood the system with with something uh, to go too far. Yeah, and um, for those of you who are curious out there, our magnesium plus supplement actually does contain zinc. Um, so another function or another reason why zinc is important is for is for wound healing. Um, and so we put 20 milligrams of elemental zinc in there. So that's kind of right around Jonathan's target of 25 milligrams a day, which the magnesium plus we would say take every day. It does have vitamin D in it. So 2000 IU of vitamin D, which is a pretty safe level for most people if they're either, you know, insufficient or borderline insufficient, or even if they're sufficient at most times of the year, but maybe going into winter months, they might need a little bit more vitamin D because you're not in the sun as much. Um, so our magnesium plus is one of those where I call it kind of like the, the athlete's micronutrient support system. And so it was really created to, to meet some of those needs where a lot of athletes are insufficient or deficient uh, and zinc being one of those. So not too much zinc, enough zinc. Um, and that's, that's what we have our magnesium plus for. But we did have a question come through a little bit about a little bit ago about probiotics. And maybe Greg, you can help shed some light on this. We had a question that said, how do probiotics work and why are they beneficial for runners? Um, so, it, I mean, maybe not getting too deep, but just a little bit on the mechanism of action, um, broadly speaking about probiotic supplementation and how that can be beneficial. Sure, so yeah. Um, so like Roxanne uh, spoke to earlier, when you're taking a probiotic strain, uh, I think the 10 bit, at least 10 billion colony forming units is one thing um, that you certainly want to look for. And kind of as the name would suggest, the probiotic works by uh, bacteria colonizing and, and forming colonies in your gastrointestinal tract, particularly uh, the vast majority of our gut microbes are located um, in our large intestine. And so the bacteria strain go into our large intestine and, and colonize. And kind of a real simple way I like to look at this is it's kind of like a good and a bad. There's good bacteria and bad bacteria. And, and 
with these probiotic strains, we're trying to form these good colonies that are associated with health benefits, um, be it the proper digestion and absorption or nutrients or the production of uh, microbial products of, per of protein fermentation that may benefit uh, human health. They can uh, reduce uh, immune, but they can reduce circulating levels of inflammation, which um, can be very important if we're looking at uh, immune health and trying to recover from an infection. Um, and, and in people who have uh, gut problems, so, you know, uh, leaky gut, is something we probably all heard of or runners got sometimes these probiotics will actually um, work to to increase the integrity or the health of the cells in our intestines so they'll prevent the spillover of microbial products from really the outside world into our into our bloodstream which is i think very important you would never want a whole bunch of bacteria just making its way into your blood um and, and so that's another way that the, these probiotics can promote uh healthy effects. Sweet. Thank you for that explanation. Yeah. I know a lot of times I, again, I like to think in analogies, but yeah, I think of our, our little microbes as like our healthy army friends that are the first line of defense against pathogens. Jonathan, we had a question from, uh, from one of our viewers about ways to naturally incorporate, I'm assuming this means through dietary means, zinc into the diet. I know you mentioned one, which I'm a big fan of, which is oysters. What else? Uh, I know you guys, when you do the recommendations from Inside Tracker, if, if zinc is one of them, you guys always have like a list of foods to add to your shopping cart. What are some of the other ones? Um, some of the other uh, foods that are rich in zinc, I love pumpkin seeds, um, any sort of other seeds, sesame seeds. Uh, shellfish in general is a pretty good source. Um, spinach is a good source. Wheat germ. Um, these are all uh, walnuts or nuts in general. Um, all of these are, are good options and, and also foods that we recommend for many other reasons. So you're, you're doing yourself a service if you're eating nuts and seeds or spinach or um, shellfish, particularly if you're a female endurance athlete um, for the iron benefits. So these are, these are foods that are um, solving many, many different goals. Also dark chocolate. <laughs> also dark That's chocolate. I have right here. <laughs> <laughs> My personal favorite. Um, we did have another question just came through about zinc and it comes from George. He says, what about quercetin? to help zinc enter human cells. So I am a little bit familiar with this. So I know quercetin is an ionophore, so it helps pull zinc across the cell membrane. Do you guys, are either of you very familiar with quercetin supplementation in general or have any insights there? No? I thought it was an antioxidant, but maybe I'm mistaken about that. I've seen some, re I've, I've seen David Neiman present some research on quercetin. I thought it was related to its antioxidant effects, but that's the, I, I, I think the literature is pretty unsubstantial in, the, in its efficacy. Yeah, that's about where I've been with it. Um, and again, I did hear something to the extent of quercetin does actually help zinc uh, enter the body. But um, George, thanks for the question. We might have to follow up with that one um, on a later date. But let's move forward. What about, I know you guys, we've talked about vitamin C, getting it through the diet. There is some research to suggest that like higher doses can be beneficial if you're traveling, if you're, you know, maybe a little immunocompromised. Um, so looking at the research, they're saying 250 milligrams up to a thousand milligrams or a gram of day of vitamin C is not only safe, but it's also cheap. So you can buy those little packets that have about a bajillion <laughs> milligrams mm -hmm. of vitamin C in them. Um, it is water soluble. So excess amounts will be excreted usually through urine. What are your, what are your thoughts on vitamin C and when should we be taking it? Should we be taking it all the time every day or should we getting it through diet? Uh, Jonathan, what do you think about that? So my, um, my take on that is many people can and should get their uh, vitamin C through food. Uh, fruits and vegetables are a great source. Um, the, the, the downside that I see with supplementation of vitamin C is that it can impair um, training adaptations, particularly if taken at, in a high dose. Um, 
But if you're training hard and you're sick, you're doing yourself a disservice anyway. So often those two mechanisms aren't um, happening at the same time, but it's something to be aware of, you know, if you are training hard and taking a high dose of vitamin C, you might be limiting your potential adaptations. Right. Yeah. And Greg, you've probably heard a bit about this as well. I know, um, you know, one of our very early formulas of goo did have antioxidants, including vitamin E and vitamin C. And we later amended the formula to take those out because we, we saw the research saying that, you know, high dose supplementation of antioxidants right around or during exercise can blunt the beneficial responses and therefore impair your adaptations. You know, you're not going to get as, as good, as strong as a result. Um, but, you know, could you take vitamin C outside that exercise window to help support immune health without negatively impacting exercise? What are your thoughts, Greg? Yeah, uh, I think that's a good question. And it's funny because I feel like when you think about health, right, the first thing you think is immune health, at least, you think about taking vitamin C if you're getting sick. And, and I think um, if you're like traveling, right, or you're stressed or, or people you know are sick or you've been around people are sick, uh, taking a vitamin C supplement probably isn't, isn't going to hurt particularly, um, if it's just a, a few at a time. I, I said at the very beginning, I take, uh, zinc and vitamin C or my intermittent, uh, nutritional supplements for that exact reason. Um, so, so certainly probably wouldn't hurt just a couple of times, but yeah, as Jonathan said, um, there's not a lot of substantial literature in its favor, but there is certainly a lot of literature that it really undoes a lot of the training adaptations that we that we do and specifically uh exercise right is supposed to cause damage and it generates these reactive oxygen species that ultimately are what mediate training adaptations and the gains that we make and if we're taking uh antioxidants we're just undoing all of that damage that we've caused and, and so we're not allowing our our body to adapt and repair to that damage so um yeah, I think not not necessarily bad every now and then, but I certainly wouldn't make a habit of it. And then as Jonathan and you guys have both alluded to, uh, getting it in our diet is probably the best way. The, um, the, the caveat there is that the vitamin C is known as one of the, the most common deficiencies for Americans from a micronutrient standpoint. This comes because many people either don't have access to fresh produce or 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 choose to eat it. Um, and this is definitely an easy one to, to both miss, but also add back in. Right. Yeah. And, and I think a lot of people think vitamin C and they, they're trying to think of food sources and they automatically go to like citrus fruits, but it's important to realize that you can get a lot of vitamin C from like vegetables, like broccoli and cauliflower right. and bell peppers are actually higher than a lot of your fruit sources. So, um, you know, any produce, just get some produce in there. You're probably going to be getting some, you know, tons of micronutrients and vitamin C would be among them. Um, we had a question come in from one of our salty squad member, Annalise, and she says, I have a sweet tooth and sometimes tend to splurge on sugar. How bad is that? And how much sugar is sort of okay? And while I don't know that this is specifically immune function related, I think it's a valid question. Uh, Greg, do you have any insight you can provide for Annalise? sugar is carbohydrate and it's contributing <laughs> to our nutrient availability. So I think if uh, consumed in moderation, I'd say keep having some sugar. Yeah. But, I mean, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, no, I mean, that's mainly what I would say. If you're eating it in excess, it can certainly cause inflammation, which is going to impair, impair immune function. But, um, you know, if, if you're exercising, Carbohydrate and sugar is uh, undoubtedly a primary fuel source. So in moderation, I see no problem. Yeah, I know, you know, from my point of view, it, it's all kind of about what you're doing when you're, when you're having sugar, you know, how active you are and, and things like that. So I would say around exercise, it's probably more okay than not around exercise. Or if you're sedentary in general, you should probably really kind of watch your sugar intake just for general health and metabolic reasons. But people who are very active tend to have higher energy requirements, higher carbohydrate requirements, and 
you know, while it might be devoid, if it's a simple sugar of a lot of other nutrients that we've been talking about, which it's important to get, you know, your micronutrients and vitamins and minerals and uh, things like that, it does fill that need for energy and for carbohydrate. Jonathan, what about you? Any, any insights there? Yeah, your, your answer of it depends is what my answer would have been. And, and uh, you both said the same thing, essentially. Um, it depends on, on what you're doing, when you're doing it, um, and all of that. Um, so yeah, I just echo what, what both of you have said. Okay, guys, we're getting close to the end of our time together. Um, question that often comes up, how much vitamin D should I take? And Jonathan, I kind of want to throw this your way because I know you know, at least for me, when I'm working with people that I advise and, and I have access to their uh, biomarker results. So for instance, their vitamin D levels, that can really determine what the course of action is as far as advocating how much vitamin D they should be taking. You know, people who are way lower on that, on that more deficient side might need a more aggressive supplementation schedule. What are your guys' guidelines when it comes to that? Like, what is your little algorithm, I guess, come back with? Does it change based on their level of deficiency? It changes based on the level of deficiency. If deficient, it will say 5,000 IUs. Um, for a maintenance purpose, uh, a minimum of 1,000. Um, 2,000 is fine. Uh, and that's, as you said, that's what's in the, the goo supplement. Um, so that's a great sort of daily add-in. Um, yeah. So, so again, it depends. Yeah. Well, no, no, that's good to know because yeah, I usually would advocate similarly a 2000 IU a day, which is why we put that in our magnesium plus. Um, one other thing I would add for magnesium plus, because we are talking about immunity is we also mentioned how important sleep is magnesium, which six out of 10 American adults are insufficient in and is one of the biomarkers that you guys look at when considering immune system function. Um, that's as the name implies is in here. So magnesium can actually help with getting to sleep and being uh, more calm and even may help with cramping. So that's one more plug for our magnesium plus just saying. And one more <laughs> plug for the magnesium plus it's actually the first magnesium supplement that I've taken that has actually restored my magnesium levels to optimal. Um, so I know through Inside Tracker that genetically I'm, I'm predisposed to having low levels of magnesium or having suboptimal levels. And I had for three years not been able to find a supplement that worked. And that's the benefit of the test, retest and tweak. Um, but whatever I was doing was still not working. Um, and I sweat a lot, you lose magnesium through sweat. And I just couldn't replace it. I couldn't eat enough of the, the dark chocolate and the leafy greens and all that stuff. Um, and once I started taking that supplement, it shot back up. So thanks. <laughs> okay. Score I do have a question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm like, we didn't plan this. I'm just saying that's how it happened. Um, you know, a lot of people ask when I'm working with you and Inside Tracker, how often should they be testing to see results? You know, if they implement a change, add a supplement, for instance, how long between tests should they go before they retest? So um, I'm going to say it depends again, and it depends on the, it depends on what you're working on. For something like iron, if you start, um, if you start an iron supplement, you should probably test again in 60 to 90 days max to make sure it hasn't gone too high for everything else 90 to 100 so three months to four months um really at a minimum um but you could do three to six months as a way to follow up on that progress so a lot of higher level athletes are testing quarterly and and for health and maintenance reasons you could do two or three times a year so baseline mid-season end of season or just um call it, you know, February and September as two very different um, points in the year. Yeah. And I know, you know, I've used the service, obviously I've worked with you a lot in the past when preparing for big events and things like that. So I'll always try and get a baseline measure at least a couple months before I know I have a big event coming up to see if I need to change my supplementation or diet leading into that so that I'm really kind of optimized to perform my best. Um, so as far as timing, I would say, you know, two to three months before a big event and then test again, if you can kind of right before to see if the changes you made had an effect. Um, exactly. Greg question for you. Um, 
we did talk a bit about gut health and probiotics and everything like that. If you could, you know, put an ideal strategy for improving gut health, what would be like your top three recommendations that people can do easily through diet or supplementation to improve their gut health? Yeah. Uh, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> oh man. Um, I think probably making sure that we eat, uh, an abundance of healthy, um, leafy vegetables and greens. So that we're making sure we get enough fiber, um, eating fermented foods, uh, is, is certainly going to improve our gut health. And then probably trying to avoid, um, anything that, that may not help our gut health. So that might be different for, for a different type of people. And I think um, that's a bit trial and error, but those would probably be my biggest recommendations. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. And thank you to the viewers for all of your questions that came through. You know, uh, we had a really good discussion about supplementing to improve immune health. And uh, Inside Tracker is a really valuable service that can help you see, you know, especially with the immunity product, where you're at. So that if you need to make any changes, you can sort of track your progress. Uh, again, as a reminder, these episodes are brought to you by Jackrabbit. So 25% off by using the code FUEL25 at your next uh, checkout. Thank you guys so much, Jonathan and Greg, for joining us. And we'll be back next week. And yeah, we'll see you then next week, 4 p.m. Thank you guys so much. Thank you.